Welcome to the club. This is a show dedicated to helping singers, songwriters, and indie artists like you create leverage in the music business. What is leverage? It's a strategic advantage. It's the power to act effectively. It means they want you just as much as you want them, and they need you just as much as you need them. That's how you're going to get a deal that's going to give you a living, give you some longevity. That's how you're going to get the management. That's how you're going to get the publishing deal. That's how you're going to get the label deal. That's how you're going to get the booking contract, the whole shebang. That's why we called it The Climb, creating leverage in the music business. 30 buck bell, so simple, beef noodle soup. <laughs> Who came up with that? Mr. Brent Baxter. <laughs> he's, he's a award-winning hit songwriter with cuts by Alan Jackson, Randy Travis, Lady Antebellum, Joe Nichols, and more. And Brett helps songwriters like you turn pro by revealing how to write like a pro, do business like a pro, and then on the regular, he connects you with the pros. You can find Brent at songwritingpro.com. Once again, that's songwritingpro.com. And I would like to introduce you to my co-host, Johnny Dwinnell. Johnny owns Daredevil Production. Daredevil has created over 25 national TV opportunities for their independent artists. And they've done this by making them discoverable. And they've also created multiple tour opportunities through the power of digital marketing data. They've also attracted a number of investors for their artists. Investors are the money folks, and the money folks like the numbers because the numbers don't lie. And you can find Johnny at daredevilproduction.com. That's production, singular, no S, and there is no S because there is no other Johnny D. What's happening, brother? Johnny D. Light. How you doing, man? Dude, I'm doing good. So I, I forgot to tell you this. We have uh, two artists out on tour this fall. Nice. The Broken, which is Jacob Cade, we've got oh, cool. on a, a month-long run opening up for The Dangerous Summer, cool. which is cool. And then Alora, actually going out on our first tour, is going out with the Texas... Roadhouse. Chainsaw Massacre. Texas Hippie Coalition. Oh, okay. <laughs> My THC. THC. Uh -huh. Like, uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. She's doing like a 30 day run with them and super, super exciting stuff. We'll be able to promote all the shows and really get some good data on the digital marketing and repeatability of, of some of the stuff that we do. So super stoked about that. And congratulations to both of those artists. So that's exciting. Excellent. Yeah. Working with Jacob a little bit, going to try and get some stuff on his next EP on the broken. Yeah. Yeah, so, that'll be interesting to see how that works. So, <laughs> that's all right. So, yep. So, hey, listen, guys, uh, I'll tell you what. We're, we're talking about these two artists going out on tour, and it's a digital world, but still we're going to make sure that they're going out with physical media. It's really important to today's independent musician. Digital royalty payments, so small. They're, when they sell, and they're not going to make a whole lot of money on that, but when they're selling CDs, vinyl, T-shirts, those those little thumb drives, those little, mm -hmm. uh, what do they call them, Brent? I, I call them thumb drives, but it's a, uh, that's a customizable kind of USB too. drives oh, USB. or whatever. That makes, that makes the money it's going to give them the gas to get to the next town on these tours. <laughs> that's super important. That's right. And for every CD, like they're going to sell at a gig, is going to be worth about, about roughly 3,000 streams for them. So let's say the broken goes out and they sell one CD, you know, or they do 3,000 streams on a streaming service the money's going to be about the same. And they're going to sell more than one CD. Let's put it that way, because they put on a heck of a show. So it's a lot of streams it takes to equal the physical products. You want to take some of that physical product out there. Why are you leaving that money on the table? So our friends at Disc Maker are going to help you not leave the money on the table, put the merch on the table, and then take the money from the table. And That's right. Shake they are down. the place. I'm working on that analogy. They are the <laughs> place to go for your discs and other physical media, including vinyl, USB drives, and even T-shirts. And you can find the fine folks at Disc Makers at www.discmakers, D-I-S-C, makers.com, or give them a call at 800-468-9353. That's 800-468-9353. Nine, three, five, three. There we go. And join the climb community if you haven't done so already. Lots of killer information in there. Lots of activity, by the way. It is not a boring Facebook group by any stretch of the imagination. It's very active. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you consume podcasts so you get all the episodes. Make sure you leave a review. If you've been thinking about it, we're trying to get our reviews up here. We're trying to get these to grow. Help us out. Go, go to iTunes, leave a rating and review. Be honest. And tell us what you think about it, what you think about what's going on here. And then finally, share this with somebody. Share it with a friend. Put it up on your social media. Put it up. Tell a friend about it at a party. Let them know that there's value in this and what you think about it. That helps spread the word, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. What are we going to talk about today? We are going to talk about how I wrote a hit song without writing it. 
How do you do that? How do you write a hit song and not write it? That sounds like that sounds like some clairvoyant thing. Did you steal it from somebody? I did, did not you, steal it. I did, did you sue I'm somebody? Artist, <laughs> and I did not sue somebody. Okay. Well, now, actually, now you have my attention. Paper, but I didn't write it. Okay. Yes. So Interesting. It, yes. So here, here's the deal. I think, and I hate to tell you this, the odds are that you are probably never going to write a hit either just like I've never written a hit. But the good news is the characters in your song just might write the hit for you. Ooh. So you might see, never write a hit, but the characters. It's a clever, it's clever twist. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so I'm going to give you some backstory on this. So I guess it's been about a year ago now. I was at the Martha's Vineyard Songwriting Festival teaching a, a songwriting workshop with multi-hit songwriter Jimmy Yeary. And man, just some good advice that is like, I just got to keep going back to And so I relearned something that weekend. And the thing about, I love about teaching songwriting is that it's a great way to continue learning the art, the craft, and the business of songwriting. You know, to say, if you want to learn it, teach it. So preparing a workshop kind of forces me to thoughtfully consider a topic and put it in a framework that songwriters can actually use, like a way of writing that you can apply to your own work. And so it helps you remember. It's not a bad trade-off. But I also learn from those pros around me. And that's what happened at the Martha's Vineyard thing with Jimmy. You know, Jimmy's written... I Drive Your Truck for Lee Bryce, Kenny Chesney's Still It's Gone, Jake Owens Anywhere With You, Rascal Flats, Why Wait, and so many more. So yeah, Jimmy, yeah, he's legit. And he's also a great songwriting teacher. So he was my co-teacher for the weekend, and he kept hammering some important songwriting truths that I know and that I've used, but sometimes don't teach enough. And honestly, I don't always use them enough in my own songs, but it's on my brain again, so dive into it. And speaking of diving... It's about diving deeply into your song. You know, it's not enough, and Jimmy used a great phrase, it's not enough to throw lyrics at an idea. It's not enough to kind of stand at a distance, consider what the song idea, and then start trying to rhyme it into a story. It's not smart to rhyme it into a story. That's not enough. Not if you want to write incredible moving songs. It's about diving deeply into your song. It's about diving into the idea and diving into the story. Like, is it a story about heartbreak? Well, go back into your memory and relive a heartbreaking experience you've had. Is it about a first kiss? Well, don't just write about a first kiss. Take some time to go back to your first kiss in your mind. See it again. Experience it again. Feel the emotions. Then paint that picture. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, it can be tempting to stop at the surface. It can be scary to be like vulnerable in your song, to really go there, to tell the honest truth to your listeners, to your co-writers. Or even to yourself, don't stop at the surface because your best writing, excuse me, is down deep. You know, it's not at the surface. So, you know, talking about throwing lyrics at an idea, you know, so you just listen to, hopefully you just listen to the song title challenge that dropped on Friday. And on Left Undone, that Randy England, thank you again for sending that in. Mm-hmm. You know, he's sending this title and it's like in a co-write, like let's bounce it around, let's bounce that ball around, see what's there. And say so you come up with an idea and, you know, what you hear on the song title challenge is top of mind you know, just blowing and going, going all out for 10, 15 minutes on that idea and then going. But when you pick the angle you want to ride at, you don't want to keep up that pace. You know, we're, we're doing a fast pace brainstorming thing, but once you find it, man, it's time to slow down and go. Tap the brakes. Yeah. Tap the brakes, honey. Slow that roll. And not just to start going, okay, that's our idea. Let's start. I'm going to start just throwing, spitting out lines, man. I think it's smart to take some time, chill and go, okay, what's, what's that really like? Yeah. One question be very powerful. What's that really like? Yeah. Well, huh? <laughs> I was going to throw some lines at it. No. What's that really like? Could be yeah. in that situation. Like, can yeah. we get in that headspace for a minute and write from there? It's going to take you in a different place than just like, I'm on a deadline. I got to spit this song out or I'm, I'm inspired right now. Let me throw some lines. At the thing is you want to become the character in your song. You know, if your song is a memory or part memory, even if you lived it, right? So it's a memory. You, you want to try and go back to that time and place in your heart and your mind. You want to feel those emotions again and go, wait a second. I see it from a distance you know, in my memory, but let me just really go back there, inhabit that space again. But even if your song isn't a past experience of yourself, what if you haven't lived it? I think then you really have to become the character in your song. You have to imagine what it would feel like and really feel like to be the person in that situation. So this is where I get to the part where I wrote a hit song without writing it. Aaron Enderlin and I, neither of us lived the story of Monday Morning Church, which was the first hit for both of us. Went top five for Alan Jackson many moons ago. But, you know, the thing is, I didn't live that story, but I kind of did for a little bit. And 
so this became, I had the kind of the hook line about my heart being as empty as a Monday morning church. And so I was like, what's that about? You know, and when I came upon the notion of a guy whose wife had died and she's, and he's having a crisis of faith, I'm like, whew, okay. I went to my imagination. Now imagine what the house would look like if I lost my spouse. And I wasn't even married at the time. I was in grad school and college, but I'm just in my mind, I'm becoming that character. What's that situation? She's the more spiritual of the two. She's probably has her Bible on the nightstand. Okay. And if I'm lying there and my wife is gone and I'm ticked off at God, I'm just mad at this whole situation. I look over and I see the Bible and it's going to tick me off. It's going to make me mad yeah. because I'm not ready to pray. I, I'm, I'm mad, right? Yeah. I'm going to open up the drawer and I'm going to put the Bible in there. I'm going to slam the drawer shut because here I am wide awake. My wife's not lying in bed next to me like she's supposed to be. And there's that Bible there and it's ticking me off. And that became the first few lines of the story. You know, I imagined how it would feel. And I could picture myself in bed alone yelling at God, right? I became that character in my imagination and that character, that situation and starting to feel that, that showed me the stuff, you know, the furniture I put in there. It showed me the the piano that she would play that I just can't close the lid on. Cause that's like closing the lid on, you know, so good. Many things. And I'm not the only one that does that. So Jimmy year, talked about that. So we talked about that in Martha's vineyard. He and Connie Harrington and Jesse Alexander didn't live the story in their ACM and CMA song of the year. I drive your truck. It was someone else's story. So Connie was, I think driving in one day and she heard on NPR, the story of, you know, they're interviewing the father of a fallen soldier. And they're mm. like, what do you do to remember him? Or what do we said? I drive his truck. And mm. she, oh, oh my gosh. And so she cries and she calls him and they could bring her and Jesse and Jimmy get together. And they became the guy who lost, in this case, a brother. It was, in the interview, it was a son, but it just had to do a brother for the story, which instantly makes it much more, many more country singers could sing it because the age thing, being a brother than a son. But anyway, they put themselves in the shoes of someone who lost their brother in Afghanistan and drove his truck as a way of coping with the loss. And Jimmy was like, I could see the whole truck. Like I pictured the truck, you know, I closed my eyes. I went there and, yeah. you know, he had some personal stuff in his life that he could tap into for emotionally. And so he tapped in that emotionally and then just, he just pictured it, right? He wasn't throwing lines at it because we've done that. We, I know I've done that where I'm throwing lines at it, but I'm not really present in that moment of the song. Mm -hmm. I'm there like writer. this most songwriters, here. especially amateur songwriters. They're not present. Yeah. I mean, I'm present as in I'm working on the song, but I'm not present in the song, in the situation of the song. But that's what they did. Jimmy went into that situation. He saw the 89 cents in the ashtray. He saw that half empty bottle of Gatorade on the floorboard. It's like, what is this truck? And he pictured this truck. You know, that's, that's how they got all those great images in there because they saw them in their mind's eye and they, they went, they became the character. And they pictured themselves tearing up that field in the truck and they brought themselves to real emotion, even though they hadn't lived it. Yeah, no. I think this is why I constantly refer to songwriters as artists. Yeah. Because it's the same process as a singer has to go through to interpret lyrics like that, like mm -hmm. what Alan Jackson did or what Lee Bryce did to sell that. Right. You've mm -hmm. got to feel that when you sing it. Otherwise, you if, you're it, just, right? if you're just see yeah, if you're just singing the lyrics and there's something to be said about that. Like I'm, I know somebody very well who is a monumentally fantastic vocalist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that would do really well on Broadway, mm. but can't sell a country lyric to yeah. save her life because she can't get inside that lyric. Somehow it didn't just does not connect. It just comes, it, it comes across like vanilla white bread. Yeah. There's no, there's no pain in there. There's no, it's just not selling it. And then I think about the process that actors have to go through to, <laughs> to read that lyric or to read that line in the script and then act it out and where they have to go to do that. There's like movie stars that are big personalities like Burt Reynolds, you know, that's yeah. just, they play themselves. Right. But then yeah. there's actors, there's your actors, you know, there's right. the Philip Seymour Hoffman's there's Kevin Spacey's who can just yeah. really, you feel, they make you feel something because they're in there, but they don't, they're working with intention. They don't just, roll in and start reading the script. It's like, they've got to figure out like, okay, who is this person? And here the lines are already written, right? Right. But think about what an actor has to do to get inside of that person. What's their backstory? Why, why is it that they have a short fuse when it comes to this little subject matter? Mm. Like what happened? Yeah. And 
it's interesting. I've heard him talk about finding the character. Well, the character's on the page. It's written. No, it's a yeah. script. But they right. find the character somehow. There may be a little thing that, and then I walked around and I picked up a thing a certain way. And it's like, oh, wait. And something unlocks it. Yeah. And they aren't just reading the lines. They're connecting to the character. They have to find some sort of connection, a place where they can emotionally invest in that. And same thing as a writer, man. Even if it's a fun song, a goofy song. And, and hey, man, I'll be honest. Some days I do that more than others. <laughs> you know? Right, right. Sometimes I am throwing lyrics and ideas and it's clever and it's fun. And you can have some success with that. But, man, those great ones, those ones that are really going to change things and move the needle. It's like, you know, when I slow myself down and I go there. Yeah. It's just a lot more real. It's a lot more honest. You're going to get those little details that someone who's just throwing lyrics at it isn't going to get. I had somebody describe me one time. It's like describing a truck. You want to describe it from inside the cab, not from outside the truck. And the truck is a metaphor for the situation, the song, the emotion of it. If you're just throwing lyrics at it, you're describing the truck from the outside. You're just blowing it going. You're like, this is what I've heard in a thousand other songs. And this is what they say. And this is what I kind of think it would be like to be in the situation. But man, if you climb inside that truck, inside that situation, inside that emotion, and then you look at it, it's a, the truck looks different from the inside looking out than it does from the outside looking in. And our job is to go into the truck and notice the 89 cents in the ashtray or to notice those little things that the Bible is left on the dresser to notice these little things that just make it real. That's the difference. You know, I think it takes an artist to, which to me is a person who is, you know, number one has the want and the need to communicate things of this nature, right? To communicate Mm -hmm. feelings and to where most people fail who are wannabes, right? They don't go in they don't go in deep, you know, like there's a Stanislavski was a famous Easy for acting teacher in New York taught method acting, you know, and there's some method actors who literally become this character. They're in character the whole time that they're shooting the movie because mm-hmm. yeah. that's how they, that's how they operate. They can't like turn it on and turn it off, but they go into that. They go in really, really deep. And I know like, cause I, I've got a lot of actor friends and it's, if you haven't lived that, right? Then they find something else that has happened to them Mm -hmm. to draw the emotion from. And that's how they create that energy, like a tragedy or Mm -hmm. elation or whatever. And I think that's what you're talking about. Like practice, what a great little exercise, right? If you're listening to us right now and you feel like you haven't done this, do this, like go in and go back and some lyrics, even some, you can do lyrics that are already written and just go back and see if you can make them better, right? By who is this person go down deep and and try to unpack visually everything that's there as you see what's happening in that room, what's happening in that car, what's happening in that truck, what's happening at that school, like whatever this song is about, like, who is she? What is she wearing? What does her hair look exactly like? What's funny about her hair, you know, or something like it. And you just start, you know, what does that, you said, what does that look like? What does that feel like? What does that? I remember writing a song called graduation day. And it's about a kid that's being bullied. And it's like encouraging. It's, it's going to be all right. You'll be okay. You'll have your say come graduation day. Like you're going to get out of here. These mm-hmm. are not the best years of your life. You know, just going into that. And, and I was blessed. I was not bullied. You know, there'd be a, a one guy or two that mess with you every now and again. But whatever. On the whole, I wasn't bullied. It helped that I got six feet tall in junior high or whatever. But yeah, yeah I, was, I was six foot two freshman year. Like there you go. <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't there yet. But, <laughs> but you're going, okay, what is this? And I was picturing my own junior high, you know, in high school. And I was picturing those hallways and going, school bus drops you off just like a a soldier, throw your books, you know, throw your bag over your shoulder and and try to disappear, you know, and the bell rings, take the safest hallway, but you can't avoid them all day. I don't think I ever had to go, what's the safest hallway to go down? You never had that challenge. Yeah. To to where you had to think like that. Yeah. Yeah. But, Going in, that was my job that day was to go, okay, well, I, and that was before I had kids. That was my job that day was to become that character that had been bullied and go, yeah, what's the safest hallway? And lunchtime, you, someone sticks a foot out and everybody laughs, but you won't cry because you're not going to give them that. Those different things of going in there, that's our job. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, that's where you job. find the specificity. It is. That's where you get away from the moon in June. The flowers are in bloom. <laughs> and, it's not like, and they're mean and you're scared and you don't know what to do. But no, it's like the bell rings and you pick the safest hallway. 
but you can't avoid them all day. That's the difference of going to getting down enough to go, okay, this is all. Well, there are probably different ways you can get to that class and where are they probably not going to be? Which one? And then just having to do the mental chess just to get the freaking class. Yeah. Of going, okay, how do I get there? Yeah. Without running into the group. It's like, and you're in survival mode, right? Like that's right. like fight or flight, like survival mode. Yeah. Like in I'm that moment, that- that's what that means to a fifth grader. It's huge. It's like, it might as well be Nazis. You might as well be a, yeah. a Jew. You know what I mean? Like, like that's to, to your mind at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, yeah, that's your job to go in there and make it that real to yourself where you can get specific. Cause the thing is, if you don't, you can end up being clever, but clever is it's fun, but it's not enough. Clever. You, know, you still have to bring heart and not just head to it. The head is where you describe things and you're, and you're kind of clever in terms of phrases and all this different stuff. But playing with words is not going to get you where you want to go. You got to really feel it because I've heard somebody say that basically wordplay still has to be true. You know, yeah. you may say this and like, oh, that's such a cool line because I did the thing with the right and the left and the up and the down and the, it was clever. It's like, yeah, but is it true? Yeah. If you're in that situation, is that really true? Is it true to the human condition? Is it true right? to the human condition? Have you been there? Is that how, really how you would respond? Is that I how can tell you're not asleep. I know the way you breathe, so I can tell you not, you're not asleep right now. Is that the line uh, that I love so girl, much? Girl, I know the way you breathe, so I can tell you're not asleep right now. Yeah. Like yeah. the first time I heard those lines, I was like, I know exactly what's happening right now. I'm <laughs> right. there. I'm lying in bed, you know, like, and next to my significant other. And there's so, like already because it's true, right? Because it's yeah. so true. Like you can tell like, it, oh, I mean, that, that's what we're talking about. here. Yeah. And that was going more into memory <laughs> than imagination. Because <laughs> we, hey, who hadn't been there if you're married or whatever. And so find those little details. Yeah. And so it, that wasn't trying to be wordplay. That wasn't trying to be clever. But man, yeah, you're just going for the heart because you dive into that situation. And that song you're talking about, Let's Fight, is about you're not getting along with your significant other. But it's like, let's fight. Let's, let's work this out. And then let's fight together to overcome this thing that's come between us is what that's about. But going, okay, I've been there enough. I can go there. And even if you haven't been there, what would the situation look like? You know, what can you glean from that? And partly the, that's why God made co-writers because maybe you can't be the one that bring all that, but your co-writer can. So sometimes they're the ones that are providing the emotional engine and mm-hmm. you keep the tracks clear. And that's cool too. And sometimes like if you're going there though, if you're trying to go there, if you're operating from a place with intention mm-hmm. and you're trying to get in there, you might just, spill something out that isn't going to be the line, but it's going to get your co-writer to mm-hmm. remember something Yeah, to see some other specificity that's going to make the difference. Yeah. And you know, just a little sidebar, something I've been trying to, I've been trying to start on because I have so many kind of rituals and stuff, but there's a book I got, I think it's from Natalie Goldberg. It's called Old Friend from Far Away. I think I don't have it in front of me, but it's a book on like writing a memoir, but it's more broken down to these little exercises. And it'd be like, give me, and I've just started on it, but I love just the kind of writing exercises. So I'm trying to do it when I can, but it's like, okay, now today, give me memories of the color red, go for five minutes or Hey, go 10 minutes on. And that's interesting. On a female relative, like an aunt or your mother or your something, just give me memories and stuff. And it's just interesting stuff. Like give me memories of water, you know? So it's not this chronological autobiography, but it's like, I want to practice going into that, into my memory. When we moved into this current house we're in, I, I made sure that I brought all my photo albums up and have them out. And I haven't had time to go through them yet, but it's like, I want to start working my way through them and just reliving part of that past me and past, you know, when my parents had, when they were younger and just some of that stuff, when I was a kid and different houses I've lived in, it's like, I want to, that's something I want to start doing to kind of go through there and kind of excavating some of that archaeology of my personal history and, and writing it, using some of those for song starts and prompts and stuff, but just to practice going in and feeling things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's part of the gig is feeling. It's a muscle. It's a muscle, right? Like, it is. would you say that? Like, like the more you do it, the, the stronger it gets, the easier it is for you to get there. Cause you kind of yeah. know what you got to do. Well, and are you familiar with free diving? What that is? Mm-mm. 
So free diving is it's a sport where basically it's how deep you can dive with no oxygen. Oh, no okay, help. Okay. It's free diving. It's like free climbing. You're climbing without a rope. Yeah. And then I have like one little guide rope so you can kind of plumb line so you know where's straight down and whatever. But yeah, it's basically like <gasps> a splash, <laughs> you know, yeah. and just how, how deep you can dive and get back up without being dead. <laughs> and so there's the whole thing. So it's almost like that emotional free diving where you practice going a little deeper and a little deeper and you get more comfortable. You build stronger lungs and, and better cardiovascular. And that's our job is to free dive emotionally and into other characters as well, not just our own history, but just all that stuff. And so I try to do things where I practice that and where that's I'm cool. going, going deeper and connecting and not being afraid to put those things on the page. Maybe it's in a journal where I don't show with anyone, but then that makes it easier to put it on a page on a lyric and throw it out in a co-write. And so find some of those exercises where you can do that. That's really cool. I, I wish I would have, when I was trying to write songs and stuff, I wish I, that would have been something I could do, like just some building blocks. There's something, here's, here's, here's a little hill. See the hill, take the hill. <laughs> exactly. And do all those kinds of memory. That's really interesting, actually. Yeah, and there's less pressure because you're not writing a song. You're not sitting in a blank page going, okay, what am I writing about today? You're just like, well, I'm doing these exercises to connect with something. And so it's like you're doing your sprints, getting ready for the game. You're yeah. Yeah. Muscle and you're building capacity and running stairs. You're also building yeah. skill that you may pull some of that stuff out because you, you go into those memories and those images and all that stuff. That's all in there. You're just tilling it up where it might be there when you need it later. But that's, that's a big thing. You got to really feel it. You got to dive into your songs deeply. So just slow down and ask yourself, really, what's this feel like? Is this really what, or am I just throwing lyrics at it from outside? No, you got to crawl inside. Big thing is, remember, you might never write a hit song, but maybe the characters in your songs will. So be that character, even if it's yourself from an earlier time, or if it's you now, but really be you. Yeah, and, and get into it. I mean, that, that's the biggest, with amateur songs, that's the biggest, that's the probably the number one problem with amateur songs, I would say, is... They're just kind of throwing lyrics at it. They're just trying to be clever. It's very superficial mm. yeah. and it feels superficial. Yeah, it does. Right. It's a very assembly line. You know, normally when we start off, we're very emotional because that's why we write is we have mm-hmm. something to come out. Then we start learning about craft and then we get very crafty and we get very head, not very much heart. And it's assembly line. It's a product. It's a little widget. And it's like, okay, now it makes your other stuff. I didn't quite understand. Now I understand it, but I don't care. Mm-hmm. You want to come out the other side where you marry the heart and the craft, and then then it's becoming something special. Now you're cooking with oil, yeah, and now, yeah, and now yeah, you're getting exactly. down there. And you're going to find some really very, very emotional ways to communicate what you're trying to do. You'll put somebody there. Mm-hmm. You're going to put them right there. Exactly. You know? I'm going to communicate clearly and effectively and compelling. And, and actually that's, I have an opportunity. If, if you're tired of your songs, not connecting, if, if it's like you play your songs out, it's like they just either go over people's heads because they don't get it or just somehow disappears in the back of the room. Like it never happened. If no one's coming up going, I mean, this thing like Monday morning church, so many people came up. It's like, Oh man, that first line just slays me that left your Bible on the dresser. So I put it in the drawer because I can't seem to talk to God without yelling anymore. Oh my gosh. You know, I had so many people come up. It's like, dude, that's just, slays me if you're if you're not getting people coming up quoting lines or moments pulling an image out of your song there's something probably missing and i want to help you get that so in the month of october i'm hosting a it's a new workshop i've never done this one before it's called your map to a hit song lyric Uh, so basically if you're tired of your songs not affecting your listeners not being compelling if you're tired of your songs not being noticed if you want your songs to be more memorable to connect with the listener more and to affect your listeners emotions this is the workshop for you. MAP stands for Memorable, Accessible, Powerful. That's what we're talking about. It's a four-night event talking about how to make your songs more memorable so the people can come up and talk to you about it afterwards, more mm-hmm. accessible so they know what they're talking about and more powerful so they, they're moved to talk about it, <laughs> basically. You know, yeah. you want to move their emotions, you want, but you also want to access their mind so they understand what you're talking about. And something memorable they can go talk about later and tell their friends about it or come up to you and say, man, that one part about blah, 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 or now I know to look it up. And it's not like it never happened. It's the worst thing your song can do to somebody is do nothing. The worst thing your song can do is nothing. I feel like when that happens, it's like, it's the difference between if you watch a movie and you love it and you tell somebody about the movie as opposed to acting out the movie, 
right? <laughs> like when we're talking about songwriters, yeah. like it, I think like when you said you're telling somebody that you're they're angry or that they're hurt or mm-hmm. that they're emotional, it's like third party ish almost. You're telling them about something that you saw as opposed to actually living it and yeah. putting that on paper. Johnny, let me tell you about this joke I heard. So this joke is start off with a knock, knock. And then the guy's like, who's there? And the other guy was like, you know, it telling somebody about a joke. No, just tell them the joke. Yeah. Yeah. Like, be in it. Yeah. Don't yeah. Tell us about the situation. Just be, show us. Show yeah. us. Yeah. It is about telling somebody about a movie versus showing them the movie, showing them the movie's going to be a lot more powerful because they're going to connect and they're going to, it's going to draw them in. Right. You got to be that character. Show them the movie. Don't just tell them about a movie. I heard about this movie, blah, 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 blah. No one ever cried because of that. That's right. That's right. And you got to, you got to get in to make it come alive. So, yeah. and so if you're interested in that, if you want your songs to come alive and be more memorable, more accessible, meaning people get it and more powerful, meaning not only do they get it, but they care. Then I think your map to hit song lyric is going to be a good workshop for you. If you want to get the details on that, Easiest way is to let me give you a gift. Go to giftfrombrent.com. Just download my free ebook, Think Like a Pro Songwriter. And that also, not only do you get a helpful ebook, but it's also going to put you on the Songwriting Pro Insiders list. So it's going to let you know about the details of this workshop. You can also go to my blog at songwritingpro.com and look at the bottom one of my Monday blogs or over at freddie.com and it should give you a link there. But the best way is giftfrombrent.com. Download the free ebook. And that way I'll, I'll be email, let you know about this and you can join and your songs are going to get better and you're going to start getting noticed. And that's a good thing. There you go, guys. All right. Well, if you haven't joined the climb community, please do so on Facebook. This is a very busy Facebook group, very, lots of activity, lots of stuff going on. So we'd love to have you in there. You got to ask to be let in, but we let everybody in. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you consume podcasts. We're trying to get our ratings and reviews up. So do us a favor. We know you've been thinking about it. We know you've been wanting to do it. You just haven't got to just go make it happen. Go spend 30 seconds. Leave a rating and review. Be honest. Tell us what you think and why you keep listening. And then finally, share it with somebody. Let let people know why you are spending this amount of time. We're very grateful that you're here. We, we're here to help. We're here to serve. When that is communicated to somebody else, then they feel honestly like, okay, this is, we're checking out. And that's what we're yep. doing, right? This podcast exists because we want you to win. So keep on climbing. And we'll see you at the top. Ooh,